Please continue to enjoy the hors d'oeuvres while I uh, introduce myself. My name is Steve Knowlton. I'm president of the board of Washington Electric, and I'm happy to welcome you to our 85th annual meeting of the members. I want to let you know that um, voting is still continuing, and will the ballot box be open uh, until 6.30 this evening? It's over uh, underneath one of those basketball uh, basketball hoops uh, over to my right. Right now, to start things off, I'd like to introduce David Young of Washington Lecture. He serves as the Safety and Environmental Compliance Officer in our Engineering Operations Department. And uh, he will present a safety minute uh, for us. Uh, a safety minute, I usually think, is extending about five minutes. Uh, we at WEC here take our safety pretty seriously, and it's, it's an integral part of our mission, both uh, for staff and for uh, our members as well. Um, following the safety minute, I will introduce our featured speaker, uh, Roger Hill, who will present, present to us before our, our dinner um, uh, in a short time later. But first, David. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. I'll try to uh, stick to under five minutes. Um, David Young, as he said, uh, <clears throat> safety is in the forefront of everything we do, but we also want to extend it to you. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we, in the uh, co-op currents, we've been adding a safety minute, but you're getting the live experience here. So uh, I believe this is the first live safety minute. Um, I'm gonna go through something quick that influenced my safety and the way I think about safety. Um, let's see if this works. Oh, there we go. Um, a while back, I heard a presentation from a gentleman. His name was Lieutenant Charlie Plum. He was a pilot in Vietnam, and he was shot down and became a POW in Vietnam. And he was actually with uh, John McCain. And hearing his story, I can't imagine what he went through, but he was um, presenting gratitude to the parachute packer. That's the person behind the scenes that uh, does things to influence his safety that ultimately brought him back home to his family. Uh, no matter how bad things get, there's, there's something to be grateful for. So uh, the parachute packer, this stuck in my mind on how I could influence safety around myself in my home. And this is something I hope that you guys can bring home and uh, think about how you can influence, influence safety around you. Uh, we're trying to avoid the worst case scenario, right? We gotta make sure that things don't fall through the cracks. I've got some VIPs in my life. Uh, there's a lovely wife that takes uh, our children to school every day. But if things don't go right, um, you're not mindful about safety, bad things can happen. Uh, this is my VIP crew here. Uh, so every morning my wife takes our children to school and probably unbeknownst to them, uh, I get up, especially in the winter time, and um, I take care of them. And it's in little things, it's shoveling the steps, it's uh, salting the drive, uh, clearing off the car, uh, all this stuff because I know my wife's going to be dealing with two children that don't want to go to school. And this is my part to keep them all safe. Um, it's all behind in the background, right? So there's also the fifth season. It extends no matter when. Uh, you know, I walk by and she'll, sometimes she'll mention this. She's like, I know you cleaned off my camera. And all it takes is walking by and sliding my thumb across the camera on the back of the car. But all these things have an impact, right? Um, there's everywhere you look, there's things in our houses that could cause an accident. And it's uh, the guys joke, do you ever have any good news? Because I'm always talking about the things that went bad as a way to learn about what you need to do to avoid uh, issues. Um, at my house, there's constantly stuff on the steps that could be um, the hospital visit pretty easily, right? Rolled ankle or, um, or worse, a tumble down the stairs here. Uh, this slippery stuff. This was an actual picture I took uh, my last employer. Um, somebody left a comical banana peel on the floor. 
Um, but there's always something you can slip on. The more common thing was uh, maybe coffee or water on the floor, and that's all it takes, right? S stepping on a stone. And um, when you become safety conscientious about safety, you start noticing all these things. Uh, poor lighting is a huge contributor. In fact, at our shop, we have a tool bench, and um, that we recently, one of the apprentices installed a light over the bench that's connected to the generator. So when we're going out, we're getting our tools, getting the equipment ready to restore power. Uh, there's actually lights there. We don't have to walk around with flashlights to get our, 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 uh, our parts and stuff. So these are all the things you just gotta watch out for. Um, I like to, you guys have probably heard this before, right? You find a penny, you pick it up, right? But uh, instead of the penny being heads up, you gotta think of it being you know, heads down or tails up. And uh, there's a chance for you to impact somebody else's safety or be somebody else's good luck, right? So if you flip that penny over, you're gonna be somebody else's good luck. So uh, this is what I uh, like you to think about is we have a takeaway from here. Uh, there's Maverick, uh, this is about Halloween time, but uh, <laughs> I pack his parachute every day. Uh, one last thing, that's my, my safety minute, but I want to remind you in case of uh, an emergency, the exits are the doors that we came out of, either out to the left and right or straight out the front door. I'd like everybody to meet out front so we can make sure that we get everybody out of the building in the unfortunate scenario that that happens. Time? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. Now, our guest speaker, Roger Hill, is known to many of you as the voice of <clears throat> weather prediction in Vermont. Uh, for over two decades, he has um, been forecasting weather for the listeners of Radio Vermont. And he also consults with Vermont's uh, electric transmission company, Velco, uh, to provide timely forecasts for utilities like Velco and also for all the other utilities in the state. Uh, we've asked, um, <clears throat> oh, I should also point out that he has um, uh, also created a weather forecasting and data service uh, named uh, Weathering Heights which is ranked highly among weather blogs around the country. And it reflects his passion for meteorology. Uh, I had to ask him uh, earlier if this also reflected a passion for Emily Bronte, but uh, he allows it. It did not. Um, and we've asked him to speak on the timely subject tonight of winter weather in Vermont. As uh, members of WEC, and I think indeed uh, customers of all uh, Vermont utilities uh, around the state have noticed uh, what appears to be the, uh, the impact of increasing wind and wet snowstorms um, on, the, on their electric service and on the duration of their outages in recent years. The implication of, if this is a trend that continues, the implication for WAC and other regional utilities and their customers, of course, is is uh, how to re-examine, uh, if you will, the, the, twin, the twin tasks of reliability, keeping the lights on, and resiliency. How to plan for the worst case, as Dave just talked about, the worst case scenarios of, <clears throat> of, of the, the weather, the damage caused by weather, and how to bounce back as, as quickly as possible. Uh, so I'm going to ask, ask Roger to come up and speak. He's going to take a few questions at the end, knowing that he uh, stands between us and our buffet dinner. And I'm also going to highlight uh, that uh, Lewis Porter, our general manager, will follow up at the end of this meeting uh, with the discussion of WEC and outages. Um, and this will take place uh, after, the, uh, uh, after the door prize the awarding of door prizes, so that uh, for those who wish to stay, uh, you will be available for discussion and questions in a topic that dovetails, I hope, on, uh, on Roger's presentation. So, Roger. Thank you very much. I just want to 
just want to see if this pointer is going to work. Yes. Everybody can see that, right? <laughs> so um, what we're going to do here is I think I'm going to take this portable uh, stand up on here. There we go. That's the Okay. So as you can see here, my presentation is going to cover some of the topics of the storms that we've been seeing over the last couple of years. We're going to go back and reach back to one of the bigger storms. And um, what I've done is put together the top five Washington Electric Co-op uh, outage storms. And most of them, of course, occur in winter, but not always. We get you know, issues when we have uh, summer thunderstorms and this kind of thing. So what we're going to cover, though, is uh, the great Vermont flood, of course, the 9 through 10th. It actually started, I believe, on the 8th or 7th. And uh, some of these are kind of referenced with the National Weather Service and how they set up and everything. So it's kind of one of these kind of deals. Um, but uh, just going down some of the heavy wind snow events, you can see that there's quite a few of them. And uh, unfortunately, these seem to be kind of a, a trend. Um, and the, uh, we'll get to some of the conclusions of after looking at one of these, uh, these storms individually, just about each one of those. So the storms will focus will go back to 2022 and uh, right through this uh, most recent, some of the most uh, Washington Electric Co-op outages that we've received, uh, which was not that long ago, really. And uh, these storms uh, met the state of Vermont's definition as major storms under their uh, service quality reliable plan, right, reliability plan. Um, the requirements uh, needed for Washington Electric Co-op to meet the major storm classification are 10% of our people out all at one time, 1% of members out for 24 hours, and then of course extensive infrastructure damage, like broken poles and various components that need replacement, this kind of thing, due to the fact that they were either got blown down or damaged in one other, whatever facet, I guess. So we have, of course, a lot of hardworking linemen uh, that are out there. Of course, there's a lot of uh, logistics involved, uh, what they're doing, of course, when there's a bunch of outages. And of course, it's not just our electric co-op that's seeing those outages. It's pretty much uh, wider spread. But sometimes we get uh, you know, a local storm here that only affects the uh, Washington Electric uh, area. Um, doesn't happen very often, but occasionally that happens. Those are more of the marginal type storms. Most of the time, they affect just about everybody uh, in, some, in some way in the state of Vermont. A lot of heavy work to be done, and of course, this is a, kind of a dry version here. Uh, no snow on the ground. Nobody is having to hump out, you know, three feet of snow or whatever. Uh, but uh, of course, it's a constant battle to try to keep the power up. These folks, of course, are very hard working, and there's a lot of things in the background that goes on to try to gear up for this, including trying to forecast weather for, for what I do, basically. So we're gonna start with the pre-Christmas high wind event, and this was back on the uh, 23rd of December. Um, this severe weather event was um, the top of all the storms in Washington Electric's history in terms of cost and damage. It was just a windstorm. It occurred in December, of course, a couple of days ahead of Christmas. But uh, the, the uh, duration of people being out was the longest six days. There were 41 broken poles, and at any one time, there was a peak of 5,772 folks that were out of power. And so this was a very significant system. Uh, the interesting thing was, with this particular storm, on the eastern side of Vermont's Green Mountains, typically when we get an easterly or southeasterly flow of air at high speed even, it doesn't really affect the eastern side so much. It really downslopes on the western side. It affects more Green Mountain power. And we talk about the western slopes of the Greens where the winds actually go over the mountaintop and they accelerate and come down. However, this particular storm 
just did a number uh, pretty much statewide. I'm going to show you some of the forecast stuff that we use. First of all, the setup here, this is a, you can kind of see North America. It's a little bit small in the back there, but um, what you can see is this kind of trough of lower pressure, the jet stream a lot. This is about, um, oh, about 18,000 feet, 500 millibars. And so this is the driver of this entire system. On the right hand side, we have the surface uh, pattern, and you can see there's a very wound up, deep area of low pressure. This is really wound up. And the pressure gradient, these lines that kind of get close together right through here, is what was over Vermont. That indicates high winds. This was um, our Christmas high wind event uh, modeling, and uh, you see a lot of the reds here. Now, I'm going to go back here real quick. There we go. Uh, so what you can see is the green mountains is sort of darker color right here. Well, these winds are over for hurricane force. In fact, it was over uh, around 100 mile an hour gusts in the, in the uh, Mount Mansfield, for example. But you can see a lot of this red was greater than 50 miles an hour. And you can see that in the Washington County, Washington Electric Co-op region up into the Northeast Kingdom. There was a lot of high winds here. Now this is another model that was also kind of seen. You can see the, the very strong winds. Strongest, sure, on the mountaintops, on the western slopes, but even in many of our local valleys. And so this is some of the modeling that we used showing this uh, particular setup here. Don't want to get too much into the weeds with this, but this is a cross-section, what we call a buff kit. It is a, kind of a tool that I use um, that can kind of, you can kind of see where the low-level jet is, how elevated off the ground, and whatnot. Well, if you see those purple colors, I'm going to point to them right here. This is basically a cross-section of a very strong winds, and these winds here are about 40 right here, and this is under 1,000 feet, so you advance a little bit higher in the altitude there, up in the sky, you would hit stronger winds. You go up higher, you get stronger winds yet. These are greater than 50 knots, and in some cases, these are around uh, 70, 80, 90, 100. That's not unusual when you're very up, you know, upstairs, we're talking above, say, 10,000 feet. But what's unusual is that this particular setup here, these winds were down to 1,000 feet. So we had basically sort of like jet stream winds, almost at surface, and that's what caused the high wind event. We have the next one down. This uh, was a significant situation, of course, for especially the city of Montpelier and many of our local rivers, of course, flooded. The uh, Great Vermont Flood. Now, it's a um, National Weather Service, uh, and their report used basically the 10th and the 11th, but um, really, we had uh, flooding that actually started, in, of course, in Worcester, Vermont, uh, the day before the actual bigger floods had developed. And that was kind of a lead into the whole business. And so a lot of the western slopes of the Worcester Ranch was really kind of ground zero where all this all began. And we had, of course, excessive rainfall. And uh, you can see that the number of broken poles caused by the infrastructure problems were around 13. Peak out because of the flooding was 2135. And of course, this lasted about five days. So this is number two in terms of a big deal here for Washington Electric. Why am I not advancing? Stand by one. Hmm. Where's my IT friend? Roger, roll the thing on the side, the right side. Roll it down. I'm not getting it. Huh. I must have hit something. This is a rainfall real quickly and some of the model modeling that we use. 
and you can see these reds, well, that's greater than about five, six, seven inches. And so models are really showing this event, uh, really laying down a tremendous swath of moisture. And again, this is a bigger picture, as you can see. Uh, this is North America, that's California. But you can see these, these long-range models that we do, when I do the outlook, for example, uh, say uh, five, five days, six days out, it was showing up amazingly that we were going to have some major flooding. And so National Weather Service, of course, was gearing up for it. Uh, a lot of folks are gearing up for it, but sometimes you see this in the modeling and you go, this can't be right. So everybody's holding back until the, the watches and the warnings go out. So uh, that's kind of how this played out. But needless to say, a tremendous amount of rainfall. This was the river forecast gauge real quickly, and you can see kind of a double peak here. The first peak was from the Worcester side of the Winooski River Basin down the Winooski River. Then a little bit of a pause, a downtick, then an uptick again. And this is from the sort of upper basin of the Winooski River, Marshfield, Plainfield, Cabot, and so forth. That water took a little bit longer to rise, but needless to say, we were well above major flood stage. And of course, we know what happens. But it affected our utilities as well. Now, I have a comparison here. On the left-hand side, this is the flooding that took place on January 10th, 11th, and you can include this, the, eighth, uh, the eighth on that, the Friday ahead. But you can see that the purples here were greater than, uh, I, believe, I believe, six, seven, eight inches here. And on the right-hand side is our green. And so you can see the two um, side by side. This flooding was pretty equal to what we saw in Irene, except of course it came up a, a big swath all the way up the eastern seaboard. Post Thanksgiving, uh, when snow event, this was now last uh, uh, 2023 uh, Thanksgiving. So we're talking just last year here, not that long ago. But what you can see is anytime we get this sort of all oh, roughly about five, six inches of wet snow, it has higher water content, it needs to have about a half an inch of melted precipitation in that snow, in that wet snow. Anything over about a half inch of, of uh, melted precipitation in that snowfall causes extra weight. The trees then lay down on the power lines and the power lines stab or they get tripped. And so consequently it causes the power outages. So as you can see here, we have um, uh, basically, uh, roughly about uh, three days of outages. The peak was 7,000 out, that's uh, pretty significant. And we had five broken poles with that uh, episode. And again, that was last, uh, the start of this actual winter last year, the, November the 27th. Following that, well, I'm gonna go through the, uh, the makeup here. This is kind of classic. Okay, typical trough of lower pressure, it spins up the surface low, comes up the coast, and indeed, because it's picking up a lot of warmer air and it's that sort of marginal temperature kind of deal, um, you get wet snow. And that's some of the modeling of what it looked like. And the interesting thing was that we had rain in the Champlain Valley, not a lot of wet snow, but of course just elevated along the spider of the Green Mountains a little bit to the east, a little slightly colder here makes all the difference. All it takes is a couple, three degrees, and you get tremendous differences. So what I want to show you here is that this is just the, that particular day, that particular storm. We had the maximum temperature of the day and the minimum temperature at night. What's important here is this sort of darker blue, not the dark, dark blue, but almost. You have basically, anytime we have wet snow events, that wet snow loading is going to load up with temperatures between 30 and 35. When you have temperatures colder than 30, no wet snow because the snow is a little bit drier. It just rolls off the trees. It doesn't stick like velcro. But anywhere in that 30 to 35 degree temperature range at night, that means all night the temperatures are not going to rise. It's only going to get colder toward the morning. So what accumulates on those trees continues to accumulate and hence we get wet snow loading. This is becoming extremely common. Wet snow lo loading, this is localized right here in the Washington electric area. So what we have here 
is um, the number of uh, poles broken, five, is kind of a, you know, a, a, you can see this tree and landing on the lines. Everybody saw a lot of this kind of business. And, but it was only four to six inches of wet snow. All it takes is about five tenths of an inch, about half an inch of uh, melted precip, and then the form of snow weighing on trees, boom, we get out of this. And this is the setup of this particular system. They all look fairly similar. That is, a trough of lower pressure to the west, the flow picking up moisture off the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico, spinning up at a surface flow, picking up all of that moisture coming in, ramming it over the parts of New England off the Atlantic Ocean. And the Atlantic is warming quite a bit. And we're going to get to that here in a second. Okay, this is heavy wind snowstorm, March 14, 15, last year, not this year, 2023. We might notice a trend. We're getting them in the fall, we're getting them sort of in December. Not a whole lot in January and February, and then you're getting them at the tail end, the back side of it, more like uh, March and into April. This is the new trend. So this is the 14th, 15th last year, and you can see that it's not as bad broken poles or a couple, uh, for example. You can see that it was about a three-day average total. Heavy wind snowstorm, this is the 14th, 15th, 2023 again. This is what we're looking at. Same kind of setup. It looks like a, basically a trough of lower pressure, spins up a coastal low or a nor'easter, boom, picks up that warm, moist Atlantic air, ramps it inland, and the temperatures are between 30 and 35, boom, wet snow loading, boom, power outages, right? That's what it looked like in the forecast modeling. In this particular case, um, models were not as good. In this particular case, they were uh, probably some of the heavier snow was a little bit more into the wet area, not just the Southern Vermont, but Southern Vermont got hammered. And that's kind of part of the same thing here. You can see different modeling, and again, 14, 15, 20, 23. This is a heavy wet snowstorm, March the 10th, this year. You probably all remember this one. The interesting thing about this is that this is my, uh, my camera, and what we have here is I'm looking at completely bare, snowless ground. Nothing on the ground at this point. It had all melted out. Very weird winter, a lot of oscillations in temperature, and so when we peak those warmer temperatures, boom, you melt all the snow out, it all runs off, of course, goes into the rivers and whatnot. But, you know, no snow on the ground, and then all of a sudden, you get a heavy wet snowstorm on the 10th of March, broke three poles, two days of outages. And this is the current setup of that. They look kind of similar. They're always going to look this way. Trough of lower pressure to the west over the Great Lakes or whatever. Another coastal low pulling warm Atlantic moist air over and wrapping it into interior portions of New England. Heavy wind snowstorm again, this is uh, kind of some of the modeling. This had some backside high winds as well. That is, the winds are blowing on the northwest side here, and so there was some stronger winds at a couple of points there. This is April 4th through 5th, 2024. We can almost remember this pretty freshly in our minds because it wasn't that long ago, right? So, uh, again, this is one of those type systems that uh, heavy wet snow loading, temperature is uh, between 30 and 35, and uh, this is what took place. And it was a, a nasty storm in April. That's the setup. You see a common setup, a trough of lower pressure, or in this case, a cutoff low surface low off the coast, nor'easter, feed coming in off the Atlantic Ocean. It happens every time. Conclusions. A warming climate has changed the types of our snowfall to a wetter one. We're seeing a lot more wet snowfalls now. We're not seeing the dry powdery snows. You think of like in Utah or the Rockies. We're seeing more of the snowfalls that would normally take place in, say, southern New England, Boston, Connecticut, New York City. In the recent past, the dry snowfall would hinder travel, but not utilities. Dry snow is fluffy, it blows around, it's, uh, you know, you get whiteouts and things like that. That's uh, more with dry snow because it's so light and fluffy, easily blown, right? Well, it doesn't affect any utilities. 
The interesting thing is you can get two feet of dry snow, our normal old-fashioned Vermont snowfall, what we used to get, say, two decades ago, more commonly, say 20 to 1, 25, 30 to 1, um, and we can get not a power outage. The only power outage associated with those big snowfalls, even if it was over two feet, a real big dumping, the only power outages would be somebody who goes off the road and crashes into a pole, and that's it. That's what a dry snowfall looks like. Big time on the ground, you see a lot of snow on the ground, very little on the trees. Why? It's really cold, and that gives it kind of a cold look. A dry snowfall has been more rare these days, just as I was saying. Uh, instead, we see many more of these wet snowfalls, and all it takes again is that half inch of moisture or more weighing on those trees, knocking those trees down. Winter conclusions for the next few years to come. I'm thinking uh, we're heading into a La Nina now, out of an El Nino this last winter, so we're going out to the other cycle. And what we're gonna see is more frequent winter rainstorms mixed with ice and minor snow, especially in the fall, the first half of winter. During bigger storms, we'll see wet snow loading likely uh, to continue more common than these dry snowstorms that we used to see in the old days. This equals more power outages, and I just want to emphasize this. More power outages to come, I'm afraid. Also, gradient wind storms, like we saw that big uh, pre-Christmas January, uh, I'm sorry, December 23rd storm. Well, that was uh, basically a uh, more of an anomaly, but we will see these gradient wind storms in the fall and the early winter to continue, and a second flare up during the late part of the winter in the spring into March and April. And that's when the winds are not so much out of the southeast, they're more out of the northwest. And of course, large temperature oscillations are gonna continue probably for the next winters to come for the rest of our lives. We're gonna see this sort of, you know, not really staying cold all the time, not staying sub-freezing, but having many, many, many thaws. This is our forecast from the European model of what uh, might happen this summer, and I just want to call your attention. Sort of the warm colors here are to the right here, and this is above normal. And for New England, the European model, which is one of the better models, is showing that we're going to have a warmer than normal summer. So get ready for more heat. Uh, but the main heat is really going to be out west. That's what the European model thinks. This is, uh, what about precipitation? Well, precipitation, rainfall, kind of near normal. This is what NOAA, National Weather Service, thinks. Uh, you're seeing above normal in temperature through New England here, and much of the uh, sort of Rocky Mountains interior west. And then you're seeing above normal rainfall forecast. When you have above normal temperatures in the summer and above normal rainfall also, that typically means thunderstorms. Get ready for a lot of thunderstorms if that pans out correctly. This is another model we use. This is called the MM. Um, it was, I can't remember the actual, it's just all these acronyms, you get lost in them. Anyway, it's an American model, it's very good. But then one of the things I want to point to here is you see the heat. This is above normal. So warmer than normal summer, and the summer is designated as June, July, and August. And then look at above normal rainfall. So if you put these two together, more thunderstorms. Summer conclusions. Warmer than normal plus more precipitation than average means more thunderstorms and at times severe weather more power outages. I'm afraid this summer could be one of those kind of summers where we see a lot of uh, you know, damaging winds, wet microbursts, occasionally a squall line, and the oddball tornado is a possibility. Heat waves have a higher probability this summer as well, especially in the mid and later part of the summer. Dry spells or drought are frequently followed by heat wave, followed by heavy flooding. So it goes dry, hot, flood, dry, hot flood. Mark my words, watch. And that's it. Couple questions for anybody.
So does anybody have a, we just have time for probably a couple questions. So anybody have a question? Go back. Way back. <laughs> You mentioned that there's going to be more heavy wet snow and that causes the trees to go down onto the lines and that causes the power outages. So my question to you is, are you adjusting the line and clearing budget for right-of-way maintenance to clear the trees so that we don't have the power outages? I cannot address that, but at the after dinner, we're going to all get together. And at that point in time, we're going to address your question. I know that personally, at the road that we live on, we just had tree cutting. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm certain that it, actually other trees would have come down on those power lines and more than likely caused power outages. So tree cutting is a, is a big deal, the right of way, making sure that those trees don't come down. I'm just going to end you on this one last, I'll take one more precedent to this, but has anybody seen, uh, take a look at some of the smaller birches this year? They're cuckoo. Look at them. All of the wet snow loading events that we're seeing are changing our birch trees. They're all over the place. Take a look if you don't know what I'm talking about. That's quite amazing. One more question. We have one more question right here. Um, my question is, um, how, uh, how much, let's see, I had so many different questions in my mind, this is actually embarrassing, but um, I, I was wondering to what degree um, we will change our methods of, of uh, heating and cooling, um, with, with the heating events, which you haven't talked about as much, um, I also worry about heating and drying with all the ash trees that we have that are dying. So we've, we've suddenly got a big load of, um, of wood, dry wood, in the forests of Vermont and New England with the ash tree deaths. And if we get droughts and um, heats, then we too are um, eligible or subject to fires. Wondered about that. Yes, um, we think of fires, we think of uh, from California, and it's a fire state. The West, Inner Mountain West, dry summers, lots of moisture in the wintertime, things dry out by the time you get to, it used to be the time you get to September, October, November. We had massive fires. This is back when I was a kid, even in California. This is the norm. Now they get fires year round. Now we get zombie fires, actually, that are still smoldering and burning in places like British Columbia and the Alberta area, the boreal forest. All that smoke comes across in the jet stream and drops in. Well, fire is definitely something in our future because what we're going to see is this extreme wet period followed by extreme dry periods. And we're getting this more variable kind of cycle of this kind of thing, and at some point we're going to get a drop, and at some point we're going to have things dry enough, not just our typical Vermont um, fire season, which is only like April, where things dry out up to the first snow, and then we leaf out. Like next week, we're starting to leaf out now, but next week or two weeks from now, it pretty much ends the, the Vermont fire season, it's all done, because all the leaves come out, and we get what we call transpiration that adds moisture into the uh, lower part of the atmosphere, due to the, the, the vegetation. So all of that's gonna change. Instead of that kind of a, a situation where we have the Vermont fire season in April, we could see fire seasons potentially in fall, um, maybe in the summer. Let's say we have a very low uh, precipitation summer and we carry that over into the fall. And it's, let's say it snows normally in the winter. It, the next spring, exacerbated that cycle, and now it builds up, builds up, builds up. Well, that's kind of what's going on in the boreal forest. 
and the reason why we're seeing a whole lot of fires there. So if it can happen north of this in Canada, it can happen here in Vermont. That's why uh, I'll, I'll end with that, uh, and thank you very much, everybody. just doing is, uh, rather than everybody go all at once, uh, I would like to suggest that people over here on the side where I'm standing uh, start the process of going over and then, uh, and then we can follow, follow on so that uh, we don't have a huge buildup over there. So if the people, people in front of me could uh, start to search. Hello again. I'm Steve Knowlton, president of the board, and it's time for our business, the business meeting, which forms part of this annual meeting. And I'd like to start off first by introducing my, my fellow board members who are sitting over here to my, to my left. Uh, Susan Alexander, who is, she's en route. Susan Alexander is from Cabot. Betsy Allen from Plainfield, who is also secretary of the board. Don Douglas, Orange, treasurer of the board. Steve Farnham of Plainfield. Uh, Mary Jess Skinner of Middlesex, vice president of the board. Um, also, uh, uh, Richard Rubin from Plainfield and Gene um, Hamilton from Plainfield could not be here tonight. Uh, Gene has a, a, an illness in the family, uh, not serious, I believe, but uh, enough to uh, require her, her presence. Uh, I would also like to introduce uh, attorney Ron Shems. Ron, are you here? Ron is uh, counsel for the board. And Katie Titterton, there she is. Katie is uh, our co editor of Co-op Currents. So, and I would also like to recognize uh, some visitors here tonight. Paul Lambert uh, of Georgia, Vermont, is <clears throat> visiting from the Vermont Electric Co-op up to our north. And uh, he is, serves as vice president, uh, one of the vice presidents of that, that co-op's board. And uh, Charles Van Winkle of Underhill. Charles, are you still here? He is uh, treasurer of the Vermont Electric Co-op. Um, <clears throat> Paul is also here, uh, uh, he's wearing another hat. He is also from um, uh, VE, Vermont, Energy, uh, 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 Vermont Energy Investment Corporation and is also representing Energy Efficiency Vermont here at this, at this meeting. And uh, as I'll mention later, from, uh, uh, Efficiency Vermont is providing one of the door prizes, which is right behind me. I would also like to recognize a few other visitors who are here. Representative Carl Demro represents the Orange One District. Carl, are you here? There he is. <clears throat> Carl, in addition to serving in the legislature, he is also an author. Uh, having written the book, uh, The Complete Guide to Trail Building and Maintenance. So uh, I've not, I admit I haven't read this book yet, Carl, but I'm looking forward to it. And I'd like to compare it to uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh, which may be a similar, in the similar vein, I don't know. I'll see why after I read your book. Christine Hallquist, is she here tonight? Well, Christine, uh, <clears throat> former CEO of the Vermont Electric Co-op and former gubernatorial candidate, is now serving as director of the Vermont Community Broadband Board, a uh, very important role in our rural community. Also here tonight are Jared Duvall and Kara Robichek. They're back here. Uh, both of them are directors of the Energy Action Network, which uh, some of you might be familiar with it. It's a nonprofit organization, which uh, among their other efforts, uh, provides a comprehensive 
uh, I'd say a comprehensive tally of uh, how energy, not just electric energy, but how energy is acquired and, and used in the state. Uh, and this is to inform a broad variety of planners and interested citizens uh, with available facts on where we are in this area and uh, where we might be going. So they perform a valuable service to uh, lots of stakeholders within the state. Doug Smith, there you are, Doug Smith, uh, comes to us from Green Mountain Power, where he currently serves as the Chief Power Supply Executive. And Geetha Gennison. Geetha, or Geetha is uh, a consultant with Integra, uh, Integra Energy, and she is working with, with a number of utilities to assist them in their planning, and she's working with WEC uh, uh, on our, uh, our new um, advanced metering systems, uh, which we'll, we hope to be installing over the next several years. I'd like to offer some thanks at this time to uh, some of our sponsors, uh, people who provided gifts for, uh, for our door prizes. First of all, let me thank Cabot Creamery who provided the cheese for our hors d'oeuvres. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Caledonia Spirits uh, who are providing a door prize. One can only imagine what that will be. Twin State Electric, also providing door prize. Uh, Farnham Farm Sugaring, uh, those provide the, they provide the table gifts of syrup on, on each of our tables here. Hunger Mountain Co-op is also providing door prizes. And uh, Lowell McLeod's, um, which I assume will be some sort of um, chains, um, <clears throat> they're providing a very generous door prize. And as I mentioned before, Paul Lambert through Efficiency Vermont is also providing a, a door prize of an electric weed whacker right behind me. Now, um, I'd also like to um, clearly, um, I really need, I really, it's a pleasure for me to acknowledge and thank uh, the members of the Committee of Candidates uh, and the balloting committee. These are two uh, committees uh, formed entirely of regular WEC members uh, who volunteer their time and work to ensure that the election that's taking place, uh, that's, uh, the vote's been coming in through the week and will conclude tonight. They've been work, working hard with diligence to ensure the integrity of the election of board members. And they deserve our gratitude for the the selfless and dedicated effort they put into this. So I really appreciate their effort. <clears throat> also members clearly to put a, you know, get together a, a, an evening like this. Uh, many members of the WEC staff have put in a lot of effort and worked diligently to make this annual meeting the success that it is. So I would like to uh, have a hand for them and thank Don Johnson in particular. <clears throat> now, in opening up uh, this part of the business meeting, uh, I will go through some necessary steps. And to some of us, some of these have the appearance of sort of a medieval ritual uh, where we do uh, some fairly formal things. But these steps are important. I believe, to uh, how a cooperative operates in a democratic uh, and transparent fashion. Members need to be confident that when we hold a meeting and hold an election, that we indeed have a quorum, a quorum of voters, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and so this actually allows us to carry out an election, carry out a meeting and, and hold an election and uh, it guarantees that it can't be done in some slipshod manner. <clears throat> also, uh, we need to publicly acknowledge and affirm that members were notified of this annual meeting uh, in advance. We can't just sneak in meetings uh, and not let members know in order to do some nefarious thing for I don't know what. And also members um, have the chance to uh, review the minutes of the previous annual meeting in 2023 and signify their approval that this is a valid and adequate record. 
So this is what it means to be a, a cooperative that is intended to act transparently and equitably on behalf of all its members. So in a few minutes, uh, I'm gonna ask for approval of the minutes of the 2023 annual meeting. Uh, <clears throat> these were made accessible to all of us uh, as a link uh, given in the latest issue of Co-op Currents. And I believe there should be copies of the minutes on, um, on your tables that you can consult uh, in the next few minutes while I uh, blather on for a bit, uh, if you wish to do so. Uh, <clears throat> Now at this time, with regard to the minutes, uh, I will ask you uh, if I may waive a local or a, an oral reading uh, of the minutes prior to asking for approval of the minutes. So I'm gonna uh, ask you to consider this question and if you have objections to waiving a reading of the minutes uh, before we approve them uh, sometime later, uh, I will do so. So hearing no objection to waiving a reading in minutes, I'll proceed with the next part of the business plan. As I say, um, I'll give you a chance to look at the minutes if you'd like, and we will approve the minutes uh, shortly. The first item of business is certifying the quorum. This is to uh, ensure that the uh, that we can actually carry out an election, that we have enough members to carry out an election and to have an annual meeting of the members. So I'm going to call on uh, Court Richardson, who is uh, one of the chairs of the ballot committee, to uh, see if he can certify a quorum for this, this election. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I do certify that we have a quorum. We have um, 767 ballots that were received 26 were spoiled. Thank you. Um, we received 767 ballots in the mail. We've had 30 ballots collected here tonight during our annual meeting. And 26 of the ballots that were received by mail were spoiled. So do the math. That equals 771 people, members, who participated in the vote this year. And that is indeed a quorum. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Court. And thank you to the entire committee, too, for this work. Next item of business is calling for the Secretary, Betsy Allen, to validate the notice of this meeting. As Secretary of Washington Electric Cooperative, Inc., I, Betsy Allen, hereby certify that volume 85, number three of the cooperative's newsletter, the Co-op Currents, constitutes the official notice of the 85th annual meeting of members, and that this notice was mailed to all members of record on the eighth day of April, 2024, in accordance with the requirements of the bylaws. Thank you. Now, I would like to call for approval of the minutes. Does any, first, does anyone have any objection or comments to the minutes? Is there a, oh no, I think someone's just stretching. <laughs> Hearing no uh, comments or objections, may I have a motion to call for approval of minutes? Thank you. Can you state your name, please? Okay. Thank you, Monique. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Peter King. Keen, sorry. Okay. 
All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you. Now, as I go through these motions, I would like to, um, I'd like to do a special acknowledgement. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge former director Roger Fox uh, for his contributions to WEC. Roger stepped down in November uh, of last year from his position as director on the board of WEC and as vice president of the board. After serving uh, over 30 years uh, on the board and seeing WEC through a number of changes. <clears throat> I'd say among his many contributions and one which is uh, reminding, I'm reminded of today as I go through this business meeting has been his attention to proper process to make sure the member's business is conducted transparently and with integrity. And um, <clears throat> I'm doing my best to, to emulate him. I even have my copy of the bylaws right in front of me, just in case. So Roger, can you please stand up? I'd like to uh, really, uh, I'd like to. And at this point, I'd ask like, if there are other former members of the board of WEC, please, I'd like to stand and have you, rec have you stand up and just be recognized. Thanks. Here they go, great. I'd like to thank all of you for the time and commitment that you've made to this organization uh, on behalf of the members' well-being. Um, at this point in the meeting, I'm going to ask General Manager Lewis Porter to come up and uh, acknowledge some staff service and other contributions. Thank you, Steve. And thank all of you for coming tonight. Uh, it's, uh, it's a remarkable show of support for an organization that you are all uh, not only bill payers in, but owners in. So thank you. Um, you are all very lucky uh, in that you have in your employment an extremely dedicated group of people who do extraordinary work every day on your behalf and do it with grace and goodwill. And uh, I would just want to acknowledge a couple of those uh, who are here uh, today and, uh, and say, by extension, thank you to the rest of them who, who uh, are here but uh, are not, at the, uh, not to be called out today in particular. Uh, so first. Uh, Pat Smith. Where's Pat? There he is. As, as I'm sure you all know, the uh, some of the most uh, amazing and difficult work done at Washington Electric is done by the line crew. And when there is an outage, you can be sure that, that uh, members of that crew are out there uh, doing very difficult work in very difficult circumstances. Uh, until your power is restored, and uh, one of the one of those remarkable folks is is here. So, thank you, Pat. Uh, another remarkable thing about this organization is uh, how dedicated uh, the folks who work for it are and how long many of them stay in your service. Uh, and so uh, I would like to recognize Beth's work for 25 years with Washington Electric Co-op. <laughs> Beth has done uh, many, many of the jobs at Washington Electric and is now uh, a senior accountant with us. And. Um, Uh, starting, starting last year, I began to have the, the really great uh, uh, opportunity and honor to, to recognize one particular member of Washington Electric uh, staff who has gone above and beyond. And, it, and it's, hard, it's, hard, uh, it's a hard selection to make among so many extraordinarily dedicated people, but um, I try to recognize the, the person who I've noticed in the last year 
who always seems to be wherever they're needed and always seems to be doing uh, extra. Uh, Amos, is Amos still here? <laughs> Amos Turner is one of the foremen uh, of, of our line crews and uh, when there's an outage, uh, he seems to be a dozen places at once doing everything that needs to be done without anybody asking him to and with, the good, uh, with good will and good cheer. And uh, truly a remarkable person who I've had the opportunity to, to work with. So. Thank you all. Thank you, Lewis. Um, now is the time for some brief uh, reports from uh, a couple of the officers, which, of which I'm one, and then Don Douglas is another, and then you're going to get a chance to hear Lewis again briefly. Uh, I'm going to make my remarks um, short. As most of you already know, since uh, 2014, Washington Electric has been recognized by the state's Department of Public Service to be a provider of clean, 100% renewable electricity to all of its members. WEC is not alone in this, and it's also important to recognize that the largest electric utilities in the state are also voluntarily moving this direction as well. So, so WEC has been a leader but I think you can be, you can be happy that the, the, all the state's utilities, the major utilities in the state, are, are also following, <clears throat> following suit to do what, to do something that would be very uh, beneficial. We also take our, um, our, we take seriously our commitment to uh, our members' well-being in a way that's not just limited to clean electricity. For several decades now, we've eliminated the use of toxic herbicides in maintaining the vegetation underneath electric lines through both public and private right-of-ways. And uh, I'd say, but more importantly, uh, apart from these two, uh, the two issues I've discussed already, WEC members, like all Vermont ratepayers, depend on their, electri their electric service for the quality of life. We all want our electricity to be reliable at times, at all times, and its price to be fair, and a price that's striving towards the lowest reasonable cost. As co-op members, we also want to be treated as equitably as, as, equitably as possible, so that some members don't pay significantly less for clean power and services at the expense of other members. Equitability is at the heart of what it means to be a cooperative member. These principles are embodied in WEC's mission statement, which you can find on our webpage. <clears throat> and they would seem to be statements that, um, that everybody would agree to. But in the real world, there are those who don't fully share these principles. Some within government and in other areas don't necessarily prioritize uh, delivering clean power with good reliability throughout the day and the year, and at least lowest reasonable cost to all members. Now, there are reasons for this, and it's the cause for much debate. WEC members, I think, need to be aware of the complexity of this issue that we all read about and hear about. And it's important that um, we all, as individual members, try to inform ourselves from the plethora of information which surrounds us. My message to you tonight is that your board is trying to be vigilant in protecting your rights and your interests as ratepayers within the regulatory framework in which we uh, must operate. While no organization is perfect, 
We are attempting to address the emerging challenges and prospects, some of which you've heard about in uh, Roger Hill's talk. We're trying to address these challenges with pragmatic and realistic approaches on behalf of all of us who jointly own this democratic organization of Washington Electric Cooperative. Now with that, I'd like to call on Don Douglas for his treasurer's report of 2023. This past summer, uh, our family had a destination wedding in Hawaii. My nephew and uh, his bride um, decided that they wanted to get married in Hawaii. Uh, the father of the bride and I are about as politically separated as one could be. And um, I didn't want to have any arguments with Bruce. Uh, we went to the aquarium and I found myself standing next to him in front of this exhibit of moray eel. Now, I didn't know much about moray eels, but Bruce and I are reading it, and it says that all moray eels are born male, and as they mature, they become female. Well, I thought about saying something about transgender, but, but instead said that, oh my God, I think my breasts are growing. Bruce said, I'm not worried about the part that's getting larger. I'm worried about the part that's shrinking. So at least we bonded over humor. In 2022, the net margins of Washington Electric Co-op were $458,796. Last year, net margins more than double were $1,067,669. Now some of that is the rate increase that you had in January of 22. I'm sorry, of 23. Uh, more than 14%? Yeah. Uh, we had a quite a hefty margin until well, we talked about the storms with Roger Hill, and those storms cost the co-op over a million dollars. Well, even though that cost us a million dollars, we still made all of our loan covenants. I want to say something about our power supply. Almost two-thirds of our electricity comes from the Coventry landfill to gas uh, plant in Co up in Coventry. The next largest source is NIPA, New York Power Authority, and that is about 12%, and it costs about 3.7 cents per kilowatt hour. And the third largest is Hydro-Quebec, and that's about 8.6% of the energy that we buy and, and use, and that's at about 6.6 .6 cents a kilowatt hour. After that, the, the prices go up but the, the, the amount of energy that we need to buy goes down. What separates co-ops from the investor owns is capital credits. So any additional money that we need beyond just running the business goes into each person's account based on how much energy they used. In, 1998, I believe, we started retiring capital credits. And to date, we've retired $9,697,000 returned to us, the members. Each year, the board must decide, do we have enough cash to do a capital credit retirement? The, the, the millions of dollars are not in cash in a bank account. We, we need to uh, generate enough cash in order to do a, a, a retirement. And the staff helps us make that decision, but it is a board decision how many dollars we can retire and if we can retire. The community fund is another aspect of the capital credits. 
from rates, we can't really give money away to community organizations. So we invented this idea in 2003 that you can donate back your capital credits. On your table, there's a little yellow envelope. You can authorize the co-op to, to have your capital credits every year or for this year or not at all. It's your choice. We had a clean audit this year. We almost always have a clean audit. I can't remember a year when we didn't have a clean audit, but it's due to the incredible work in the finance department. And on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank the finance department for their hard work in watching every dollar. After the uh, conclusion of the meeting tonight and, and door prizes, um, I'm going to have a br very brief presentation and, and I hope a discussion with all of you who are interested in about uh, winter outages and how Washington Electric uh, responds to them. And happy to have any questions, no matter how tough uh, about that. Um, those of you who would like to stay, I hope you do. And those who, of you who don't, I will not be offended if you choose to go home. So uh, I'm going to do that after the, after the door prizes. Uh, this evening, and so I'll keep my comments here uh, quite brief, uh, just to say that Washington Electric came into being 85 years ago during an amazingly turbulent time of the the electrification of uh, the rural parts of America, including of the rural parts of Vermont. In the years since then, the electric business became somewhat stodgy, let's just call it reliable. Um, power came from somewhere else through substations and to all of uh, the houses that you all live in now. That's changed. We are now back in a period uh, uh, close to, if not as turbulent as that time uh, 85 years ago. Uh, power now goes both directions. Uh, weather has changed, as you saw from Roger's presentation. Uh, regulations have changed, requirements, member expectations have changed, the technology has changed. So we are now back in a period in which this industry, which had become pretty settled, uh, is now rapidly changing and evolving. And uh, there are many, many benefits to uh, an 85-year-old organization, stability, cash flow, uh, reliability, assets. Um, but like anything else that's 85 years uh, old, uh, an organization is not quite as nimble as maybe it, maybe it once was. Um, and so I just, I mention this, I, I say this to ask all of you to recognize the incredible changes that we are working to serve you through and recognize that those will have a lot of benefits for all of us, but they'll also have costs and challenges. So I just, uh, most of you know, know all of that, but I just wanted to, to mention that here. Thank you very much and I uh, hope to see uh, some of you after the, after the meeting for our discussion on outages. Um, appreciate it. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you, Don. Now is the time of the meeting to call for the uh, results of the voting. And uh, may I ask um, Court Richardson to come up again. Great. I'd like to thank the ballot committee for their good work. Um, as you may remember, we had five candidates uh, running for the three positions we have open uh, for, for balloting every year. The, the candidates are Pat Barnes of Versher, Ian Buchanan of East Montpelier, Olivia Campbell Anderson of East Montpelier, Stephen Knowlton from East Montpelier, and Richard Rubin from Plainfield. <clears throat> the people who got the leading number of votes 
are Stephen Knowlton, Pat Barnes, and Olivia Campbell Anderson. The, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the votes for the um, uh, are as follows. Uh, feels embarrassing to read out my own the number of votes that I get, but it's 564 for Stephen Knowlton. Pat Barnes received 471. Olivia Campbell Anderson received 398. Uh, for those of you who are election junkies, you might be interested to know that this was a very, very tight election. The next vote getter received 397 votes, one, one less. So we have a uh, very tight election. I would like to thank all candidates uh, for participating in this democratic exercise. I'd like to thank all, all the candidates uh, for, for putting their, for willing to volunteer their time and, uh, and their efforts to serve their community. And I uh, thank the two other winners other than, uh, other than myself for uh, agreeing to serve and they will take their, their positions immediately. So, let's give them a hand. Sure. Richard Rubin received 397. Ian Buchanan received 346. So, these were all, uh, I think it's, it's gratifying to see that all the candidates received uh, you know, a respectable showing and a respectable vote and had respectable support. So that's, that's gratifying to see in this community. Uh, let's see, the next item of business, before we, before we close the business part of the meeting, it's traditionally when we have uh, questions and answers uh, to any of us on the board or the general manager. Keep in mind that the general manager will be making another presentation on uh, outages and, and, and winter outages and WEX response, uh, which will come up. Following this, we're gonna have the, the door prizes, but uh, I'd like to open the, open the floor to people who have questions for any of us. Yes, one question I have, a few years ago, I was doing private duty nursing, and we had a neighbor, he was 95 years old, and we had five-day outage. He had no family, no friends, except us, and I called Washington Electric to see what they were doing to ensure those uh, members are taken care of. And I'm wondering if you have anything in play to ch do wellness checks on people like that. Uh, I have an answer to that. But I think uh, Lewis has a more comprehensive, uh, comprehensive answer to your question. Well, may maybe or maybe not, uh, but I'll take a shot. Um, so we uh, do have, we maintain a, a, a list, uh, notes on members' files if they, are in med if they have medical conditions or other things that require us to do checks on them. Uh, unfortunately, and I would ask all of you to, to ask your friends and neighbors to do this, uh, people do not update those very very routinely, and so they're, they're often ones that we don't know about until an outage happens. Uh, when that does happen, we contact state authorities uh, or other local authorities and ask them to check on the person. Uh, unfortunately, because of the way uh, our electric grid and, and all electric grids are built, uh, you obviously have to restore from the substation all the way to somebody's house, and if, and if their house is at the very end of a line, there can be many, many issues between that substation and that person's house. And so, you know, sometimes people will call and they'll say, you know, I can see the tree on the line right outside my house. Come, please, please remove it. And we, we will eventually. But if we know that there are many, many breaks in the line between those two points, it, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any, uh, it doesn't make any difference if we go and remove that one issue out near their house. So, 
the, the, the unfortunate answer is that even in those cases uh, where we know somebody is, is in dire need, what we can do is contact community groups or, or emergency services to get them assistance. Uh, often we have informal uh, groups of members or other people who will help, help them out. But there is not a way to, to restore power to one particular location generally. So, thank you. Given the uh, presentation on climate change, it seems pretty obvious there's going to be more of what we don't want to happen to the grid. How is the co-op planning for a long-range plan to adapt the services and everything else it takes to keep the power on given the extreme weather events we're having? Okay. Um, so we do know there are going to be more storms, more damage, more outages. Um, and the things that we are doing to try to address that are to uh, improve and make more efficient our line clearing program, our right-of-way program, uh, reconductor lines uh, where we can reconduct them in a way that's more protective, uh, that is less susceptible to, to tree damage. Uh, in some cases, we move lines to the road where it may be less likely they have tree damage or faster to repair. Uh, and we're also in the process of building out a new metering system, which will give us a lot more information about uh, where outages are, the cause, and, and, and what, uh, what, what order they happened in that will help us improve our outage response. But unfortunately, there are going to be, in, in, a, in a very rural, rugged territory with a lot of trees, we are going to have outages, and some of them, unfortunately, are going to last for a, some period of time. And so I, I think there's a lot we can do to, to, uh, to try to reduce outages and respond to them, but I think ultimately we also have to prepare ourselves uh, for the, the fact that they are going to occur. Well, I, yep. I guess I've got two follow-up questions. One, is there like a formal long-term plan for each oh. of those things that you talked about, and how much is it going to affect our rates? Yeah, so that's you're, you're putting your finger right on the balance, right on the question there, because everything you know. Ultimately, we borrow money, we get grants, uh, but ultimately, the most of the funding for our operations obviously comes through rates from members. Um, you know, we're a highly regulated industry, so we have plans on plans on plans, uh, both short-term and long-term plans for how to address our system, how to address financing, how to, how to manage outages, all of these things we have plans for, which I'm, you know, m most of them are on our website, and I can happy to direct you to them. Um, but so we have, we have all, all different varieties of plans. Uh, unfortunately, you, you put your finger right on it, though, implementing those plans improving both our resilience of our system and our outage response cost money. And ultimately, the rate payers pay, the members pay most of that through rates, although we have been successful in getting some grant funding and some FEMA uh, reimbursement and mitigation money. So we have solar panels to help offset our uh, electricity usage and and uh, I suspect that we're not alone uh, does the when we use it sometimes uh, we use more electricity pull more electricity from the grid than we feed back into the grid most all the time that's the case but we do feed electricity back into the grid sometimes so does that play at all into the final calculation of the fact that WEC has and uses all renewables resources. Yeah, so uh, yes, yes, in the sense that it, it does offset some of the usage by Washington Electric Co-op members, and it is obviously renewable power, but no in the sense that our power is 100% renewable independent of net metering. So, we, we all collectively made the decision to invest in Coventry, to invest in long-term contracts for renewable power, and to become a 100% renewable utility. 
that was a, I think both a good thing to do from a environmental and societal perspective. Also, it, it turned out to be uh, in, in some ways very advantageous from a cost perspective. However, being the leaders has a cost. And one of those costs is that when you then add on net metering to that system, what you're doing is displacing other renewable power with renewable power. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Thompson from East Montpelier. Um, I appreciate what I'm hearing that you're really focused on maintaining the integrity of transmission uh, to homeowners and to members, and that's fantastic. And I also appreciate that I'm hearing a recognition of the fact that climate and you know the imperfection of the beautiful world that we live in is going to continue to. Um, give us periodic and perhaps more frequent power outages because you know we don't want to cut down all the trees and we love to live where we are. With that in mind, I wonder if, if the board and staff might consider focusing, continuing to focus on power transmission and maintaining that integrity, but also focusing on members and what members can do individually to be more resilient. Could you not perhaps, uh, from my own experience, I could really use this, uh, provide technical assistance to homeowners to help, you know, I don't know the difference between a watt and, a, and an amp, and when I'm looking at my own system, I don't know how to, up, you know, I just had an electrician give me an exercise and how many amps do I need to power the house during an outage, and I swear to God I don't want to go buy, I've resisted for two years buying a fossil fuel powered generator to run my house. Why does the co-op on behalf of members you know, buy 500 high-tech battery systems and lease them back to homeowners so that we could be more resilient individually, or, or and it, et cetera, et cetera. What can the co-op do to help us as, as homeowners recognize that we're going to have power outages, help us be more efficient as homeowners and members of the co-op? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I have the same feeling when uh, members, uh, including members of my own family, uh, buy generators that, that run on fossil fuels. I, I, I recognize the need to do that, I recognize the importance of doing that, but I also see that as a, as a you know, even for the short duration that they operate for going in the opposite direction. And we want to go, and we spend, frankly, a lot of time trying to encourage people to go uh, overall. Um, Washington Electric has not yet had a, a home-based battery program. I think you can expect that from us in the next few years, uh, and that will be beneficial to members in terms of outages and also in term benefit the co-op at large in the ability to uh, to manage load to manage uh, peaks peaks and to manage load. Um, as you can imagine, for a relatively small organization. It's a lot to manage and a lot to figure out, but I think by following what has been learned by some of our fellow Vermont utilities and some utilities outside of our, of our state, uh, we can develop a program that will be cost effective uh, and will benefit members and do that, important to me, do that without uh, pushing those costs onto the rest of the membership. So if we can figure out a way that, that you can buy a battery or lease a battery from us, uh, and we can manage that for our for the benefit of the full membership while it also benefits you. I think that is a has real promise for us. Um, we are in the early stages of figuring that out, but we we are uh, actually wherever JJ is. Uh, that, that's one of the monumental jobs I've given JJ since hiring him a couple months ago. Thanks. Surprise, I come to deliver peace, not a sword. I know I've roasted you a couple of times. In the co-op currents, uh, we read often, or have read often about using the whole inventory of poles to support 
extension of internet service to those of us in the fringes of the fringes of the fringes. I don't recall seeing much mention of that in the current, and there's an awful lot of argle-bargle and false piety about the extension of the internet, but where does the co-op stand now in terms of the actual engineering and uh, predictable uh, realization of this dream which we've been talking about for years? Uh, <clears throat> until it was about 1921, uh, excuse me, uh, 2021, uh, WEC had a, uh, an ongoing effort by a number of board members to look into uh, the co-op providing, uh, providing internet service to its members. And uh, after doing some research, uh, we quickly realized that uh, to make it, uh, to basically make it so that the electric uh, customers, the electric paying customers, were not going to subsidize the, uh, you know, the internet service, that we're going to have to find grants and partners. And so we spent uh, a number of years working with uh, existing internet providers and. Uh, um, the uh, communication union districts, which are now being set up uh, around the state to provide um, internet service. So we had a number of discussions, and um, as I say, about, it was about two, two and a half years ago, um, the communication union districts uh, had felt they had enough federal funding and other support that they could do this alone. And I think, I think it's fair to say that they would look at, at the business model of a, uh, of a company that's in the competitive business of providing fiber-based internet and the business model of a public power cooperative, a regulated utility providing public electric power. And that there was you know, a bit of a, there were just challenges in trying to meet those two business plans and the communication union districts um, elected to pursue this, uh, this avenue on their own. Washington Electric has nonetheless, uh, to my knowledge, has done everything it's asked, been asked to do in terms of uh, doing what is called make ready work, which is providing the poles, making sure the poles are, uh, can accept the, uh, the insulation of fiber on the poles and to basically make sure that everything is ready for the, the internet uh, provider to come along and put their their uh, fibers up on the poles. So, uh, WEC is still engaged uh, intimately in this process, and its role is to ensure that the uh, that the poles that the internet providers will use are ready and available for use uh, as the as the communication union districts and their contractors need them. Do you have I can't add anything to that. Is that question? The government made a statement that the lives is getting even older state, meaning the population is getting older. And if you look around this room, there's a lot of us that are older, and we're living on fixed incomes. What's going to happen when the rates, because of the starts, keep rising, and the incomes are surprising for people? So how is that going to be justified so that people can still have electricity in their homes, and they don't have to make increase in the social security checks? Um, well, what I can remember, you raise a good, a good question. So how do we make how do we make electricity affordable? When, as a uh, as a not for profit business, what we do is we um, we operate the we collect the funds that we need to operate this system. We operate the system, and we don't generate a profit. Um, 
we can ask, are there fundamental changes we can make in the way that we can operate this system that makes it cheaper to run and just as reliable? My experience in talking with members, uh, for what it's worth, is, is that they value reliability of service uh, as, as their highest priority. Everybody wants, when they come home, they want their showers to be hot and their beer to be cold and the lights to turn on. Um, so the cost of the service that we provide is basically what it costs us to run the, run the system with the amount of reliability that we can, uh, that we can maximize. Uh, I don't know, do we have, is, is, could be an aspect of state government to, uh, to provide um, <clears throat> supplements for people on fixed, fixed incomes? I mean, that would be one, one conjecture. So uh, I can talk a little bit about that part, Steve. So there is a, a, a lot of concern about this, both among the legislators and among the regulators of the utility industry. And I think that there's a, a concerted effort to provide a program that would subsidize the cost of electricity for those at the lower end of the income scale uh, for those higher than that, at the, at the cost of those higher than that. There are a couple of things that are, to my mind, really important about how that is done that will matter a lot. Uh, w one, and maybe most important, is I don't think this should be done at a utility territory by utility territory basis. I think it should be done statewide if it's done. And, and that's because, for instance, Washington Electric Co-op uh, has a, a membership that is very, very highly residential. Uh, has, we have some towns in which uh, people who live there are highly energy burdened. Uh, that is, they pay a lot of their income towards energy. Um, and I think that this would be most fairly done spread across the entire state rather than uh, separating it out uh, electrical utility by electrical utility territory. Um, in any program like that, of course, you have the challenge of you, you have folks who are struggling to get by slightly above the threshold of which such a program would apply who are then subsidizing the people uh, who are slightly less well off than they are. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's a policy challenge, a policy problem that's common in these kind of programs and would, be, would have to be dealt with in this one as well. But I, I think there is a, a, a significant and sustained effort towards doing something like that. There are also short-term programs that we participate in which will provide some uh, amount of relief to lower income members, uh, but are you know, set, sets of money that, that, are, that run out eventually. Thanks. Well, seeing no further hands for questions, I'm going to to adjourn the business part of the meeting. And now we turn over to awarding the door prizes. So, uh, are you doing that, Lewis, uh, or is Dawn doing, is doing that? There she is. Okay, so get your tickets ready.
Let me just see if you think so. I can do that. Eight, one, three is the last three numbers. There you go. 
go, Gail? Nice. And what we ask with these is if you use them by the end of June, so you can just turn them into member services so they can use them. Yep, we have uh, three. So they're not going to visit Bar Hill, so we're going to get this one to someone else. Nine, eight, five. Wonderful, yes, electric. Steve, you have one of these, right? Steve Knowlton? And Betsy does too? Nice. So the last three digits are 890. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And again, thank you all. That concludes the What's door prize drawing. And uh, now is the time of the meeting when Lewis asked to have a uh, discussion over the, um, there he is, over the discussion over uh, winter outages and wax response. So I think we're gonna let those, give those people a chance who wanna leave, to leave. And those who wanna stay, hold on, and we'll set up the dunking booth for Lewis to, um, enjoy the discussion. I would, uh, I'd ask all of you who would like to talk about outages to come down a little closer um, so we can have a discussion and not just me talking at you. And I promise not to go on too long. That's perfect. So I'm, I'm gonna give you a very brief couple of slides on how Washington Electric uh, deals with outages, responds to outages, but I mostly want to talk with you about, about how we do. So I'm going to start here, and I know some of you are still filtering out, and that's fine. Y you saw from Roger's presentation that we expect more severe weather. Um, as each of these weather fronts come in, we monitor daily uh, throughout the year. Uh, what's going on? We have forecasters, including Roger, uh, give us a warning when they see a storm coming that's going to cause a major outage or has the potential to. We participate in, in uh, statewide calls with all the other utilities, state emergency services folks, uh, AOT, telecom providers. Uh, and then a the day before the storm hits, we make sure that all our folks and their equipment is ready to go and lined out. Once uh, a storm hits, uh, sometimes the members don't realize that we depend on member information to identify where outages are and to use our outage management system to identify what the likely cause and the place of those outages is so we can respond. 
So it's really important that we get accurate information. Uh, I have to say, sometimes members tell us uh, things that, that I think they think will speed our response to their location that isn't accurate. Uh, and uh, some of that's by accident, some of it may be intentional, but it, it, it can hinder us because it gives us a bad picture of what's out there. Um, our outage management system is, uh, is quite good at predicting where outages are occurring, what the cause is, and helping us triangulate how to respond to them. And then we bring in mutual aid crews. Uh, these are either uh, crews from other utilities or contract crews, um, and they, we bring them in. Uh, they are very helpful to us. Uh, in, in the Christmas storm of 2022, we had more than 60 outside people working on our systems. So you can imagine that's pretty significant against a, a normal line crew, our own line crew of 13 people. Uh, as I mentioned earlier to one of the questions, we start restoring at the substations, uh, and then we work out from there until eventually we get to the individual meter location, uh, member locations. And uh, meanwhile, the dispatchers verify all the outages, they prioritize our responses, and they assign crews. Uh, so they're working quite a bit. Typically in these major outages, the dispatchers and the line crew are working 18 hours on, and then they'll have six hours off of rest time, and then they'll come back on for 18. Uh, we have, as you all know who live here, uh, a very rural, rugged territory spread across 41 towns, and we have a lot of lines that are off-road. When a lot of these lines were built, uh, those were pastures and fields. Uh, now a lot of them are woods. Uh, our national call, call center is tremendously helpful for us when our own uh, phone answering folks get overwhelmed, but the national center also gets overwhelmed, particularly in storms like that Christmas storm where it's widespread across the region, even across the country. Uh, in addition, in our territory, as you, as you all know, we have long travel times. It could be an hour and a half drive from the farthest corners of our territory, and particularly when the roads are not plowed or there are washouts. Uh, we also have landowners who, for understandable reasons, object to tree cutting, uh, and that can prolong uh, cause outages and also prolong outages. So recognize that we, we don't cut trees because we hate trees. We cut them because they, otherwise they fall on the power lines. Um, I mentioned inaccurate reports in some cases from members, and often you'll have this circumstance in which you'll have an outage, it'll be restored, and then a day later you'll have another outage, and it, it, sometimes uh, from a clear blue sky. Often that's caused by snow unloading off those tree branches and then having them slap back into the wires and they can cause kind of a secondary or aftershock outage. Uh, and then last, uh, mutual aid crews are wonderful, um, but often they have outages in their own territory and obviously they respond to those before they come and help us. Things we've changed in our outage management in the last couple of years. Uh, we have gotten uh, much more sophisticated about what information we're getting in from the system, including from our substations and from our crews in the field. Uh, that will become even more sophisticated as we move to a more advanced metering system that will provide us a lot more information, a lot more pinpointed information, and a lot faster information. Uh, we've also increased the use of those mutual aid crews uh, for these major storms. Uh, as I say, those are very helpful but also expensive. Uh, we have also uh, improved and optimized the technology we use inside Washington Electric Co-op in terms of outage management and for our, uh, for our dispatchers to identify areas. Um, and as you may have noticed, we've expanded communication with members uh, both through the website and through uh, other, tech, uh, other technology like automated calls, uh, text, smart hub. Uh, and our map, uh, our outage map now shows uh, when crews are assigned to a particular outage and an outage uh, restoration estimate. We went into those outage restoration estimates with a little bit of trepidation knowing that they were often going to be wrong and we were going to be telling people they were going to be restored in eight hours when it actually was going to take us uh, less time or more time than that. But people seem to respond to it well and seem to uh, appreciate it. And last uh, slide here are the members' responsibilities. Uh, we live in the country. Uh, we live in a rural service, provide, uh, rural service territory, and life in, in the country is different. Um, you are, uh, have a different level of response from law enforcement and emergency services, from telecom, as we talked a little bit about today. Roads are different in the country. Uh, and so our responsibility is to do everything we can to minimize outage at numbers and duration. Uh, members' responsibility is to be prepared for the fact that we will have outages and some of them will last a significant amount of time despite our best efforts. Um, and uh, 
last uh, thing I want to leave you with is that this slide on the on the edge of the, the uh, chart, the graph on the edge of the uh, chart here is the the story of three major storms from the last 18 months or so. And as you can see from that graph, each of the utilities that serve major parts of rural Vermont w had one of those storms impact them the most of the three of us. And uh, you know, so that Christmas storm that we all remember. Uh, and, uh, and uh, with, with, with no fondness, uh, Washington Electric had a, a huge number of outages that lasted a long time. In the March of 23 storm, uh, Green Mountain Power's turn, uh, it was Green Mountain Power's turn in the barrel. They got whacked in southern Vermont. They had a five or six day outage. Uh, and then in uh, January of this year, uh, Vermont Electric Co-op had uh, uh, the, the ultimate bad luck of two major storms back to back they hadn't fully restored power from the first one when they got the second one. Uh, and so that period of time was the one in which they um, suffered, the, suffered the most. So this isn't to say that you know, every time it's going to alternate between the utilities, but merely to say that where the weather hits, how it hits, uh, matters a lot for whose territory gets the most impact. All right, that's the end of my presentation. Now I, I really want to hear from all of you. Uh, questions, but, but also criticisms of how we deal with outages and how, uh, how we respond. So fire away. Yeah. So how about grid-tied batteries? So, you know, so I've seen engineering drawings for somewhere where they're talking about putting up a building, filling it with batteries, tying it to the grid, and that way it works like a buffer so that possibly wherever you've got a major intersection um, breaking off in different directions from a substation. It goes out between the substation and the batteries, but everything downstream from the batteries is still up and running. Yeah, it's a great question. We are in the process of figuring out what our battery uh, strategy is going to be, whether that's going to be uh, utility scale batteries probably located at substations or homeowner-based batteries or a combination of them. One of the challenges for us is because Washington Electric serves so few areas that have any density at all, it's kind of hard for us to picture where we could do a microgrid or, or island certain particular areas. You know, even the village centers in our territory are generally served by Green Mountain Power, right? So there are a few places where that might be advantageous. Um, I think that will probably be less beneficial to us than to some of the utilities for that reason and the fact that we do have outages upstream of the substations in some cases, but those typically tend to be fairly short duration, an hour, a couple hours maybe at the most. Um, and that's because those transmission lines are generally, you know, they're, they're more robust, they're more resilient. They, they, the GMP crews that primarily service those lines respond to them very quickly knowing that a whole section of our territory is out. So I think there are certain circumstances in which a grid size, a grid scale battery might benefit us but I think it's probably a little more limited than it is for some utility territories. Uh, homeowner batteries, on the other hand, may provide a, an ability, particularly for those places that are far out on the end of the line and that suffer frequent outages. Um, we are also looking at hardening some of those lines, changing the conductors of the technology of those lines, uh, moving some of them to the road. Um, but all of those are, are, as you can imagine, very expensive. Other questions? I just wanted to say I thought the outage map was Great. You could look and see that, look, they're getting, the numbers are going down. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. We, we've done some work to improve that outage map and make it better, um, and I think we'll continue to do that. Like I said, we, we were a little nervous about starting to give restoration estimates, and some of the national co-op folks we talked to were like, do not give restoration estimates. But members really, uh, a lot of members reached out to us and said, I just need to know. I need to have a better idea if I need to leave my house for the night or do I need to get more fuel for my generator. So thank you. Appreciate it. Other thoughts, questions? All right. Well, reach out anytime. Sir. talking about how in the past people depended on each other more. I was just curious what, what kind of response you got to your comments. 
Yeah, good response to it. I think we need to do more as an organization in encouraging the community response and community, uh, community answers to uh, disasters of all kinds, including power outages. I think we could do more to help in that, uh, foster that discussion and, and that preparation. Um, the, that was one of the strengths of our territory and of the fact that people lived here for a long time. Generations of people you know, in the same family would live, live near each other. That's less true today, but I think we can build that through community connections and community relationships rather than necessarily through familial relationships. And I think we can play a role in, in furthering that conversation and, and, and getting it going. So it was, there, was, there was good response, and I, think, um, and I think that we need to continue educating members about that and, and not sugarcoat the fact, frankly, that there are going to be outages some of, of long duration because I think that gives people a false a false hope or false expectation of uh, that, that we're going to see a, a large decline. I do think with new meters and some of this other technology, I think we can improve our outage response, shorten the duration of those, and, and with um, things like hardening some of the lines, we can reduce outages. But given the weather circumstances that you heard from Roger, I think we're fighting an uphill battle against the the growth of trees and the growth of storms. Thanks. Anything else? Sir? Yeah. I'm on my own spur. I'm the only person out there. If my power goes down, let's say it's a lightning strike, are you going to know that? Or because I'm out on my own spur, you don't have to Yeah, so we should know it, but always call or alert us through Smart Hub. Yeah, I'm sorry. He was asking, he's on his own spur, the only house on it. If there's a lightning strike or something that only puts his house out, well, will we know? The answer is we should know through our metering system, but please let us know through Smart Hub or a phone call or email, any, any other communication that you can use. Because the, one of the consequences of using a, what they call a power line carrier meter system, which talks to the meters through the, um, through the copper power lines is that when there's a break in those power lines, we can't see beyond it. We, can't, we don't hear from the meters beyond it. So always let us know. Um, but we, with the advent in the next few years of a more advanced metering system um, that isn't dependent on those copper lines, we should have a better idea even. And we should be alerted now, but it doesn't, it's not foolproof. What's that? The, the new system will actually go through radio frequency or through, uh, we'll talk to, each meter will talk to the meters around it through radio signal or uh, through, possibly through a uh, fiber, opt, uh, fiber line if you have fiber to your house. So, where, where you have not yet, uh, we've not yet selected a vendor. I was looking around to see if Keith was here still. We've not yet selected a vendor to do that and different companies have different technologies that, and how they communicate, but it'll be some combination of those technologies. Anything else? Well, great. If you have questions, please reach out to me uh, or to anyone at Washington Electric anytime. And uh, we, uh, we do this because we like talking and working with members. So thanks. And thanks for coming.